Good morning. It is good to be together in the ways that it is safe to be together. At this very moment, my eldest child who is six is at his vaccine appointment. And his tiny body will start building immunity to the coronavirus over the next weeks. And I am so excited to be able to put him on the school bus with a little bit less terror about what might happen as first graders run around with reasonable masking, but not great. And it feels, and I know that so many others with children who are five to 11 are getting their kids appointments and getting them immune. And we are entering a new season of this pandemic season. We know we're not done. We know that our youngest people, including my three and a half year old are still a long way from vaccines. We know that vaccine compliance isn't great. We know all of the things that we know. But maybe just for this moment, I hope you can join me in the immense sense of relief and joy that science has brought to me, my family, and all of those who care about or care for those who are 5 to 11. So come, let us gather. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. I'm Tim Bardick. I'm here in my role as a member of the Sunday Services Committee. I'd like to welcome all of you to the service, both the few people here in person and the majority of you who are viewing this remotely. A special welcome to anyone who happens to be visiting this service. And we hope that someday soon, we will be able to all meet in person together and get to know one another better. People's Church is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association. We're part of a long tradition of liberal religion. Among other things, liberal religion believes we have to look at our history honestly both the good aspects of that history and the bad aspects of that history. We need to learn from our history what lessons we can learn, knowing that while history does not repeat itself, sometimes it rhymes. Liberalism also has a faith that although the path of progress is uncertain, if we work together, we can shape our church community along with other broader communities towards a better future. I have one announcement for us all today, and that is that this Thursday at 6 p.m. is the virtual banquet for Isaac, the congregation-based community organizing group that People's Church is a part of. It's going to be on Isaac's Facebook Live and YouTube channel. And I, I hope you come. You can do it from the comfort of your home and the keynote speaker is Reverend Dr. Merritt Michael Eric Dyson, who is a phenomenal thinker and preacher on race and writer. And it's someone who we probably would not be able to recruit to come to Kalamazoo. We probably would not have been able to afford him if it wasn't virtual. So let's take advantage of that. There's also several awards that are going to be given out, including to some people in our extended People's Church networks and partnerships both through Isaac and in other ways. 
including Rabbi Simone Schicker of Temple B'nai Israel and Adrian Vasquez of El Concilio. So I hope you come. It's always a gathering with Isaac, whether in person or virtually, is always a, an experience that, that refills my, my spirits to be reminded of what we can accomplish together and then be inspired to keep doing the work of love and justice. And now it is time to sing. I have shared before that one of my friends who's a minister at another church, they have renamed hymns, hums for this season. So if you are at home, you can sing as loudly and off key as you want and no one will hear it. And if you are with us in person, I invite you to hum or be quiet or sway or engage your body in some sort of way. I'm glad you're here. Yes, it's been quite a while since we've sung this song live, so to speak. And uh, let's see if we remember it. <laughs> It's hard to believe in the sun in the dark of the night And it's hard to believe in the stars in the bright morning light Well, we all need a place we can go to learn what is real to ponder the depths of the soul where truth is revealed. Oh, this is our place. This is our home. Working and seeking, we're never alone. In this mortar and stone, these windows and walls, Love's earthly home, heeding the call. It's bread for the journey, oil for the flame. For people of love, people of hope, people of change. It's hard to believe there is peace when war rages on. And it's hard to believe there is love in the hate's raging throng. But for every brave soldier, a peacemaker takes her own stand. And for every soul long turned away, there waits a new This mortar and stone, these windows and walls, love's earthly home, heeding the call. It's bread for the journey, oil for the flame, for people of love, people of hope, people of change. When a place is wide, well. change it so the promise of love can begin here in this room oh here in these halls hearts open wide welcoming all in this mortar and snow these windows and walls love's earthly home Heating the call, it's bread for the journey, oil for the flame, for people of love, people of hope, 
people of change. We're people of love, people of hope, people of change. We're living out love, living out hope, living out change. Sing out for love, sing out for hope. Sing out for change. Now I believe in the sun in the dark of the night. Before I light our chalice here at church, I encourage you to light a chalice at home. And if you wish, you can type into the chat box for the um, Zoom service, a chalice is lit, and name your neighborhood, city, or street as you prefer. Our chalice words are this. When we light our chalice, everyone focuses on the flame. Yet it is the paraffin of the candle, the cotton of the wick, the potassium chlorate and sulfur of the match, and the oxygen in the air around us that makes that flame possible. As leaders, we are not called to be a lone beacon on a hill. Rather, we are meant to work together so that we might together shine. The elementary schoolers in our congregation are currently outside doing their religious education class. And it's a combination of native stories and nature education. And I'm gonna share the story that they all are hearing this morning with all of you. So it's a story called Gluskabi and the Wind Eagle. And it's a story from the Abenaki people who live in the, whose ancestral lands are the land that we know as Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Quebec, and New Brunswick. Long ago, Gluskabi lived with his grandmother in a small lodge beside the big water. One day, Gluskabi was walking around when he looked out and saw some ducks in the bay. I think it's time to hunt some ducks, he said. So he took his bow and arrows and got in his canoe. He began to paddle out into the bay and as he paddled, he sang. But a wind came up and it turned his canoe and blew him back to shore. Once again, Gluskabi began to paddle and this time he sang his song a little harder. But again, the wind came and blew him back to shore. Four times he tried to paddle out into the bay and four times he failed. He was not happy. He went back to the lodge of his grandmother and walked right in, even though there was a stick leaning across the door, which meant that the person inside was doing some work and did not want to be disturbed. Grandmother, Guskabi said, what makes the wind blow? Grandmother looked up from her work. Gluskabi, she said, why do you want to know? Then Gluskabi answered, just as every child in the world answers when they are asked such a question, because, he said. Grandmother looked at him. Ah, Gluskabi, she said, whatever, whenever you ask such questions, I fear there's going to be trouble. And perhaps I should not tell you 
but I know that you are so stubborn. You will never stop asking until I answer you. So I shall tell you. Far from here, on top of the tallest mountain, a great bird stands. This bird is named Wuchausen, and when he flaps his wings, he makes the wind blow. Hey, grandmother, said Gluskabi. I see. Now, how would one find that place where the wind eagle stands? Again, grandmother Woodchuck looked at Gluskabi. Ah, Gluskabi, she said, once again, I feel that perhaps I should not tell you. But I know that you are very stubborn and will never stop asking, so I shall tell you. If you walk always facing the wind, you will come to the place where Wuchausen stands. Thank you, grandmother, said Gluskabi. He stepped out of the lodge and faced the wind and began to walk. He walked across the fields and through the woods, and the wind blew hard. He walked through the valleys and into the hills, and the wind blew harder still. He came to the foothills and began to climb, and the wind blew still harder. Now the foothills were becoming mountains, and the wind was very strong. The wind was so strong that it blew off Gluskabi's moccasins. But he was very stubborn and kept on walking leaning into the wind. Now the wind was so strong that it blew off his hair. But Luskabi still kept walking, and it was so strong that it blew off all his clothes and he was naked, but he still kept walking. The wind was so strong that it blew off his eyebrows, but still he continued to walk. Now the wind was so strong he could hardly stand. He had to pull himself such a pull himself along by grabbing onto the boulders. But there on the peak ahead of him, he could see a great bird slowly flapping its wings. It was Wuchausen, the wind eagle. Luskabi took a deep breath. Grandfather, he shouted. The wind eagle stopped flapping his wings and looked around. Who calls me grandfather, he said. Luskabi stood up. It's me, Grandfather. I just came up here to tell you that you do a very good job making the wind blow. The wind eagle puffed out his chest with pride. You mean like this? He said, and he flapped his wings even harder. The wind which he made was so strong that it lifted Gluskabi right off his feet, and he would have been blown right off the mountain had he not reached out and grabbed the boulder again. Grandfather, Gluskabi shouted again. The wind eagle stopped flapping his wings. Yes, he said. Gluskabi stood up and came closer to Wuchausen. You do a very good job making the wind blow, Grandfather. This is so, but it seems to me that you could do an even better job if you went to that peak over there. The wind eagle looked at the other peak. That may be so, he said, but how would I get from here to there? Luskabi smiled. Grandfather, he said, I will carry you, wait here. Then Gluskabi ran back down the mountain until he came to a big basswood tree. He stripped off the outer bark and from the inner bark, he braided a strong carrying strap, which he took back up the mountain to the wind eagle. Here, Grandfather, he said, let me wrap this around you so I can lift you more easily. Then he wrapped the carrying strap so tightly around Wuchausen that his wings were pulled into his side and he can hardly breathe. Now, Grandfather, Gluskabi said, picking the wind eagle up, I will take you to a better place. He began to walk toward the other peak. But as he walked, he came to a place where there was a large crevice. And as he stepped over it, he let go of the carrying strap and the wind eagle slid down into the crevice upside down and was stuck. Now, Gluskabi said, it is time to hunt some ducks.
He walked back down the mountains and there was no wind at all. He waited till he came to the tree line and still no wind blew. He walked down to the foothills and down the, to the hills and the valleys and still there was no wind. He walked through the forests and through the fields and the wind did not blow at all. He walked and walked until he came back to the lodge by the water. By now all his hair had grown back. He put on some fine new clothing and a new pair of moccasins and took his bow and arrows and went down to the bay and climbed on his boat to hunt ducks. He paddled out into the water and he sang his canoeing song. But the air was very hot and still and he began to sweat. The air was so still and hot that it was hard to breathe. Soon the water began to grow dirty and smell bad and there was so much foam on the water, he soon could hardly paddle. He was not pleased at all and he returned to the shore and went straight to his grandmother's lodge and walked in. Grandmother, he said, what is wrong? The air is hot and still and it is making me sweat and it is hard to breathe. The water is dirty and covered with foam. I cannot hunt at ducks at all like this. Grandmother looked up at Gluskabi. Gluskabi, she said, what have you done now? And Gluskabi answered just as every child in the world answers when asked that question. Oh, nothing, he said. Gluskabi, said grandmother again, tell me what you have done. Then Gluskabi told her about going to visit the wind eagle and what he had done to stop the wind. Oh, Gluskabi, said Grandmother Woodchuck, will you never learn? Tabaldak, the owner, set the wind eagle on that mountain to make wind because we need the wind. The wind keeps air cool and clean. The wind brings the clouds which give us rain to wash the earth. The wind moves the waters and keeps them fresh and sweet. Without the wind, life would not be good for us, for our children, for our children's children. Buskabi nodded his head. Kamoji, grandmother, I understand. Then he went outside. He faced the direction from which the wind had once come and began to walk. He walked through the fields and through the forest and the wind did not blow and he felt very hot. He walked through the valleys and up the hills and there was no wind and it was hard for him to breathe. He came to the foothills and began to climb and he was very hot and sweaty indeed. At last he came to the mountains where the wind eagle once stood and he went and looked down into the crevice. There was Wuchaus and the wind eagle wedged upside. Uncle? Muscabi cried. The wind eagle looked up as best he could. Who calls me uncle? It is Gluskabi, uncle. I'm up here, but what are you doing down there? Oh, Gluskabi, said the wind eagle. A very ugly naked man with no hair told me that he would take me to the other peak so that I could do a better job of making the wind. He tied my wings and picked me up. But as he stepped over this crevice, he dropped me in and I am stuck and I'm not comfortable here at all. Ah, grandfather, er, uncle, I will get you out. Then Gluskabi climbed into the crevice. He pulled the wind eagle free and placed him back on his mountain and untied his wings. Uncle, Gluskabi said, it is good that the wind should blow sometimes and other times it is good that it should be still. The wind eagle looked at Gluskabi and then he nodded his head. Grandson, he said, I hear what you say. So it is that sometimes the wind, there is wind and sometimes it is still to this very day. And so the story goes. People's people are generous people. We are generous with our time and our talent and our treasure. So this week, like many weeks, I had a lot of meetings. And as I saw that in many of these meetings, board meetings and membership committee meetings and social justice meetings and 
meetings, one on one meetings with folks who had concerns about how we are living into our values as a church or ideas for new things to do. I thought to myself, I am the only person who is paid to be at this meeting. The rest of these people are showing up and doing this work with no financial reward, truly other sorts of rewards, I know. And it was just very humbling. And so I am just so impressed by all of the people's people who show up, who show up to meetings, who show up and bring their gifts of music and like their read is managing our technology, the people who are figuring out how to make our, our space as safe as possible for people to be in and teaching our children. There are so many of you who are giving of yourselves in so many inspiring ways. So thank you. And may you continue, and may we continue to be the generous people that we are. The offering will now be received. followers asked him then who should be included but Jesus said let everybody in everybody in everybody in to the circle circle everybody 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 in to the circle circle oligarchs and tyrants try to keep some in and everyone else outside so revolution sweeps across the land and the people all stand and the common folk cry let everybody in everybody in everybody in to the circle circle everybody 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 in to the circle circle Sometimes a circle is a class or creed. Sometimes a circle is made of only men. Until Susan B. Anthony says, what about me? Let me in, let everybody in. Everybody in, everybody in. To the circle, circle, everybody. circle sometimes a circle is a privileged thing excluding people for the color of their skin until the voice of martin luther king says let freedom ring let them in let everybody in everybody in everybody in to the circle circle everybody circle gay and straight rich and poor all and broken open up that door the more we are the greater we become after all we all are one bring in the people but don't stop there bring in the fish in the sea and the birds in the air bring in the rivers wide and the mountains tall we go together, but not at all. Let everybody, everybody in, everybody in to the circle, circle, everybody. Invite folks at home to read along with me the words for giving thanks. From the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life, gifts of love, gifts of sustenance, 
we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. As we enter this time of silence, I invite you to to pay attention to your body and do what it what you can do to get yourself 10% more comfortable and more relaxed. Maybe you've pressed your tongue against the roof of your mouth or have your jaw clenched or your shoulders tight. Maybe you need to stretch your back or adjust how you're sitting. Do that and enter into a time of silence with a little bit less tension or pain or discomfort in your body.
A History of Church, Including Yours, by Sean Neil Barron. One day, your church was born. Maybe it was a gathering of saints called together for the common worship of a wrathful God, ceaselessly praying between bouts of decrying the evil of Christmas or dancing. Or maybe a few brave souls answered a notice in the newspaper Curiosity piqued by the announcement of a religion where free thinking and tolerance were bedrocks. No matter how it happened, your church was born. A gathering of people, humble, caring, anxious and quirky, all at the same time, who covenanted to be with one another on the journey of life, death, and everything in between. And so it began a faithful few, beautifully imperfect, called to that central task, that human task of connecting, loving, and serving. It was just a baby, and yet it was thrust deep into the human condition, tasked to hold minds and souls, bodies and hearts, along the roller derby of disease and birth, infighting and joy, and Christmas pageants, sometimes all of those at the same time. They gathered to hear the world broken open for insightful sermons, rejuvenating music, and a community whose fierce devotion to each other's well-being rivaled a mama bear's for her cubs. But it wasn't always like that, of course. There were the trying times. And I don't just mean Phyllis or Jack, those stubborn but lovable souls, who inhabit the netherworld of committee meetings. No, I mean the trying times. When the church almost split in half over the war or integration, or when the mill left the town vacant, or when the minister crossed that line and the people couldn't speak about it for decades. But somehow you were still here, still on the town common, still the church that everyone recognizes, still the ones that show up every time you are called on, still using the communion silver until you voted to sell it. New people came and they changed things, small things, big things, things that nobody noticed as it happened until suddenly it was hard to recognize anything anymore. That was a hard moment, a tearful moment, and other things changed too. The proclamations about God, once heard loud from the pulpit, softened. Wrathful became loving. Distant became intimate. Mandatory became optional. After the war, the nursery and RE classrooms were overflowing. Each baby dedicated reminded the church of the incredible beauty of life and the gift to this community, all huddled around baby, would bestow upon this child. The history of your church is more a story of the determination of love to break forth than it is about tie-dye or chalices, sermon discussions, or social justice committee meetings. The history of the church is the history of human enterprise, evolving in its sights and sounds, yet revolving always around its core. The history of your church is the gift of potential and momentum, of baggage and personality. The history of your church is the launch pad from which you spring into action or disarray. Each day, your church is born. Ever in Our Midst by Karen Johnston. Ancestors who spoke with bravest fire, lend us your senses 
that we may know another world is on her way. Breathe into life with our participation in her creation. Forebears who led the way where there was at first no way. Lend us your persistence, your temerity, your assurance that the moral arc of the universe does indeed bend towards justice. Ones who went before us sacrificing for a future not your own, help us to give of ourselves that the common stones in our hands today might be cathedrals of compassion today, halls of restorative justice tomorrow, sheltering walls of beloved community the day after. It is Sunday morning, the day we gather. Let us be thankful and full of praise to be in the company of those who came before, yet are ever in our midst, ever in our midst. What the Heart Cannot Forget by Joyce Sutton. Everything remembers something. The rock, its fiery bed, cooling and fissuring into cracked pieces. The rub of watery fingers along its edge. The cloud remembers being elephant, camel, giraffe. Remembers being a veil over the face of the sun gathering itself together for the fall. The turtle remembers the sea sliding over and under its belly, remembers legs like wings escaping down the sand under the beaks of savage birds. The tree remembers the story of each ring, the years of drought, the floods, the way things came walking slowly towards it long ago. And the skin remembers its scars, and the bone aches where it was broken. The feet remember the dance, and the arms remember lifting up the child. The heart remembers everything it loved and gave away, everything it lost and found again, and everyone it loved. The heart cannot forget the heart cannot forget. So 
Once upon a time, not too far away from most of us, a church was born. To be more specific, in 1855, a missionary was sent from the American Unitarian Association to a small city called Kalamazoo that had about 5,000 residents. And among those res residents, the missionary found enough people interested in what he called a more liberal society to birth a church. So they did. There were 65 adults and 35 children in those first meetings. They could have no idea that they were at the beginning of People's Church of Kalamazoo. The church became established and the community started doing the kinds of things that churches do. People signed the bond of union, including the first mayor of Kalamazoo. There were fundraising projects, sewing and suppers mostly. First, they bought hymnals. Then they got a building. It was dedicated in 1863. But by the 1870s, the church had fallen on hard times. Membership dwindled and so did money. Many of the founders of that church, that first generation, had died or were aging and were no longer able to do what they once did. And there was not a new group waiting to rush in and take up their work. In 1873, the Sunday services were suspended, but the Sunday school carried on. And I love that story of a church in difficulty prioritizing its children's needs. I see echoes of that today as most of our adults are at church on Zoom while our children are in person. In 1879, the leaders of the church told the minister that they couldn't raise his salary anymore and they closed all church activities for seven months. It was a hard time. And because we are in People's Church of Kalamazoo, gathered as People's Church of Kalamazoo today, we know that that wasn't the end. But the people then didn't know that. The founding generation of the church, the people who gathered together to start this new, more liberal society in Kalamazoo, couldn't know if their church would outlive them. They just knew it was hard times and they couldn't do all of the things they did before, and that the future, like it always is, was uncertain. In 1889, People's Church had 70 members. It met once a month, and someone who was there described it as a small, weak, discouraged, faction-torn, almost annihilated society, which had no regular services and no Sunday school for three years. The faithful few had stayed by the church through the bright days and the dark days. They were loyal and brave. That church had $21.41 in its treasury. And I looked up inflation calculators. And so that's about $640 in our money today, which is the kind of amount that would give your church treasurer and finance committee many sleepless nights. And as an aside, because we are drawing parallels today, I want to assure you that People's Church is in a good financial position now. The Investments Committee reported to the board earlier this week that we hold about $740,000 in, inv in investments, endowments, and reserves, and have about $48,000 in our outstanding building loan. 
So there's gonna, you're going to hear a number of stories about churches and financial difficulty, and at least that part we are not echoing today. So know that for sure. But they were in a time of struggle then in 1889. They needed a minister and they were having trouble hiring one. They needed a sense of church again, which they didn't have because they weren't gathering. And so they did something brave. Many of you know how this story goes. They hired a new minister. Her name was the Revlet, was Caroline Bartlett later Caroline Bartlett Crane. And the fact that she was a woman in 1889 was a very big deal. In her first few Sundays, there were overflow crowds because it was such a spectacle to see a woman in a pulpit. Maybe they, there, was a, there wasn't as much entertainment options in 1889, but it was a big deal. And they were skeptical. You know, they, there was talk that all they needed to do when they hired her was just hire someone who would bury the last of that first generation who are still alive. They weren't sure if they would continue. But Caroline Bartlett Crane rose to this particular challenge, and so did her church. She was an inspiring minister and inspiring person. So within a year, Services were weekly again, and 25 new families had joined the church. And within five years, the membership had voted to change the church's name to People's Church of Kalamazoo because it was for all of the people. It became a seven day church, not just for Sunday mornings, but throughout the week with programs happening in the church building all of the time. They said there was at one point during her ministry, 118 different meetings a month in the church. So this included a free kindergarten, which was one of the first in Michigan. This included a gymnasium for women because the YMCA already existed and had a gym for men. This included a literary club for black residents of Kalamazoo. This included classes on Eastern religions and cooking and sewing and home nursing and training in the trades. The arrival of Caroline Bartlett Crane unlocked possibilities for this congregation. But before we get too far into her ministry, I want to go back to that moment in early 1889 when the congregation voted to call her. It was a very brave choice to call a woman in general, and this minister in particular. She'd been serving a church previously in Dakota Territory. This is how long ago it was. Uh, but she had not completed any of the standard academic preparations for ministry. She had kind of apprenticed her way in. And the original plan was for her to study at seminary in Chicago during the week and just be in Kalamazoo on the weekends but she saw that there was too much to do here. So others in that time period and today would rather, I'm sure, have let a position sit open than hire someone who doesn't match their imagining of what the person in that role would be. And those people, those brave people in Kalamazoo called a woman to be their minister in a time when that was very unusual. She's one of the first tiny handful of women ministers in Michigan. One of the sort of second generation of women Unitarian Universalist ministers. And at a time when very vanishingly few other traditions were ordaining women as clergy. So about nine years later, Carolyn Bartlett Crane resigned from the ministry at People's Church. She was in poor health and in the middle of a conflict with the board. And after several years to rest and recover, she embarked on a public health career. And People's Church carried on much of the programming that it had started during the Crane years. And some of the programs, like the kindergarten and the literary society, were adopted and carried forward by other organizations 
the public schools realized kindergarten was worthwhile. And over the next 36 years, the church had 10 ministers, a rate of transition that is exhausting for a religious organization and leaves a lot less energy for doing the rest of the work of the church. There were highlights though, including the beginning of an evening rest program in 1904. So at that time, Kalamazoo was a mill town and a lot of young women would come in from the surrounding areas from the, they, who grew up on the farms and work for several years at the mills. And they would live in boarding houses where they were not allowed to have guests over. And so People's Church started providing low cost meals and a place to socialize for these women that would be respectable. They couldn't go to the taverns because that would be a scandal, but they could come to the church and talk to their friends in the church lobbies and spaces and eat dinner. And they served up to 160 meals per night, these women. Another highlight of this time was the creation of Kleinstuck Preserve. In 1922, a lifelong member of People's Church, Caroline Kleinstuck, donated the land that we know as Kleinstuck Preserve to the State Department of Education. At the time, the chairs of the biology departments at both Western Michigan University and Kalamazoo College were members of People's Church, and they led a lot of the preservation efforts and turn it from a, from a not very productive farm back into a natural space. So I invite you to remember our people's church ancestors the next time you were there for a walk. But by the late 19 teens, questions about the church's future resurfaced again. Their membership had dwindled and there were financial difficulties that seemed hard to solve. And so the church carried on as best as it could. In 1919, there were serious conversations about closing the church. And in 1920, the church called a young dynamic woman to be their minister. People were hoping for a repeat of Carolyn Bartlett Crane's ministry and Bartlett Crane recommended this young woman to the church. And that was not to be because a few years later, this woman contracted polio and became paralyzed and had to resign the work. She could not be the minister anymore. An interesting side note is then her mom took the job, which I think is really interesting. <laughs> By 1990, 1923, People's Church was in conversations with First Congregational Church about merging the two churches together. In 1925 and 1926, Six church buildings in downtown Kalamazoo burned down. The cause was never discovered. And so the churches that were downtown started doubling up with each other to have enough space to meet until those buildings could be rebuilt. So for three years, People's Church invited First Congregational Church to share the building. And all of the notes I could find in the history just talk about what a scheduling nightmare that was to fit everything of two churches into one building. Again, in the middle of 1934, the church membership started another serious conversation about closing the church. The Great Depression was a hard time for many, and people worried that the church could not survive it. And then again, the church called a minister who facilitated a resurgence. 27 members participated in the congregational meeting that called Edwin C. Palmer as the minister of People's Church in 1934. The salary he was offered was half of what was paid in 1930, just four years before, and was the same that what, as what Carolyn Bartlett Crane received in 1890, just $100 a month. It was not enough to survive on. So after a couple of years of financial hardship, the Palmer family moved into the church building where they lived until the end of Mr. Palmer's life. They saved on rent and the family performed the janitorial functions. And, in the, and while there was still some struggle in the years after the Second World War, the church grew and grew stronger. So this reaches the point in our history when we make it to living memory. 
Mr. Palmer was the minister of People's Church for 22 years until 1956. And there are still some members among us who remember him. Marge Leitner is one of them, and she shared this remembrance with me a few days ago. She wrote, in the 1930s, labor unions were trying to organize against great opposition. Our church had a policy that nonviolent, not-for-profit organizations could meet for free in the church, a policy that went back to Carolyn Bartlett Crane's day and was only discontinued relatively recently. When a labor union, I can't remember which one, asked to hold a meeting in a church, in the church, the minister, Mr. Palmer said yes, following our policy. A wealthy member complained, stating, you're taking the bread out of our mouths. To which Mr. Palmer replied, I hear it is more like cake. Marge continues, I don't know if this actually happened, but labor unions did meet in our church back then. Mr. Palmer was truly a wonderful man and minister. And I'm sure you have stories about how he and his family moved into the downtown church when we couldn't pay him enough for rent. He served as a custodian of the church and restored all the beautiful woodwork. The one thing his wife wanted was a kitchen of her own. She had to use the church kitchen and she never got that wish. She adds, and I hope you include stories of the printing press he used to print the beautiful programs he created every Sunday. Mr. Palmer is the reason I am still a member all these years later. So here are a few of these programs, and I know we don't have, I don't think our camera will let you really see them in a meaningful way, but those of you who are in person can look at them as we close. And we have more of these than we need for archival purposes because they are beautiful and people held on to them. So if this is something that you would like to own, we'll have some out for people who are here or put a, let me know, put a comment in the chat or otherwise, and I will, I will send you a small, a small selection in the mail. So that's a brief overview of the first 100 years or so of this church. Why tell this story now? As Laura read earlier, the history of your church is the gift of potential and momentum, of baggage and personality. The history of your church is the launch pad from which you spring into action or disarray. It's important to remember our launch pad, to tell the stories that not all of us remember now in this moment of pandemic and uncertainty. It is good to remember that history is not only progress, it is fits and stops and uncertainties and two steps forward and one step back, or sometimes one step forward and two steps back. It's people looking at what's before them and doing the next right thing and the next right thing and the next right thing and hoping that somehow that adds up to something. I feel that acutely preaching in this room with not nearly as many people as we usually have, but overflowing with furniture for our soon to arrive Afghan neighbors. I feel a kinship with our ancestors in the 1870s and the 1920s. They were doing the best they can, navigating a time when they can't quite see their way through. And so do we. In the story I told, both of the periods of uncertainty and challenge ended with the calling of a minister. And I know the story is much more complicated than that. It's not just one person who comes in and brings on a period of excitement and revitalization. Or maybe that's partly true, but it's not the whole truth because the potential to do good and big and brave and bold things is in this community and any community always. The church is always more than who's in the pulpit on Sundays. It's the board and the religious education committee and the people who go out beyond the walls of our church to do the work of love and justice and the staff and volunteers who manage the money, whether it's $21 or $740,000. It's the people who make music and the people who call folks they haven't seen in a while to check in it's the people who cook and clean and do what needs to be done over and over and over again. 
Unfortunately, those are the stories that don't get written down as much, and so we can't tell them in the same way. They don't always make it into our archives or into our history. But we know that when times when there isn't a steady minister, the church leadership, the lay leaders step up to do so much more. So I prefer to think of it as a time when the lay leaders got to put down some things and do some other things. And it makes me yearn for what I hope will be a great putting down that comes at the end of this pandemic, at the other side of this moment, whatever that other side looks like. And I feel like none of, I can't see what that is because I think there are some innovations that we will keep using. We might have services on Zoom forever. We might have a stuffy sleepover again. I'm hoping that committee meetings on the nights that it snows are not in person. <laughs> but I look forward to a time when it is not, we don't have to recreate every single thing that we do. I know that is true in so many of our lives. It is exhausting. So there will be new potential when our minds are not constantly calculating risk or trying to figure out how we meet our mission in a new way. And that's true across all parts of our lives, I know. I can't wait to see what all of us will be capable of when we're able to set down the burden of this time. So may we remember our ancestors who did the next right thing in times of challenge. And we, we become the healthy ancestors that people will tell stories about sometime in the future. The people who, stories about people who were determined and sacrificed for a future that was not our own. So may it be so, may we make it so, and amen. Dear ones, as our service ends today, may you know yourself as a descendant of people who have survived and who have thrived. And may you feel yourself to be an ancestor of the people who are to come. We'll look back at your story for inspiration in their own moments of struggle and challenge. So let us go in peace and go in love. Mm -hmm.